Well, they're prepared for a bad deal, if you see what I mean, <coughs> a, a hard Brexit. Uh, we, for example, have set up a subsidiary in Amsterdam. We've set up a branch in Frankfurt. We have a separately capitalized entity which can deal with our European Union clients. So we prepared as far as we can. But what, of course, we can't prepare for is for uncertainty which persists. And at the moment, we do not know yet what the future arrangements for the regulation of cross-border entities in Europe will be. That's uh, part of a future discussion on regulatory cooperation, which was mentioned in the agreement, but not, not described. Um, and also, there's a big issue of, uh, in the jargon, equivalence as to the extent to which UK markets will be regarded as equivalent in their structure and their regulation to European Union markets, and that's not been decided either. So there's a limit to what individual financial institutions can do when there are still some very significant moving parts here. Uh, but indeed, the, the, the document does mention the move towards a memo of understanding, an MOU, that should come out within the next 12 yeah. weeks, hopefully shedding a little bit more light on some of those issues. What would you like to see in that document? Well, that's probably more significant, actually, for the EU-based entities that have large operations in London. <clears throat> because what the most important thing is, can the European Central Bank rely on the European, on the UK regulators to look after whether it's BNP or Deutsche Bank in London and whether they've got information exchange which allows that to continue. That's probably the most important thing. It won't be so significant um, for us, although it won't, it'll have some significance. But that's the crucial bit. Can the ECB, through its relationship with the Bank of England, still know enough about what's going on in those entities in London that is happy to allow a lot of that to continue? Uh, sir, I want to shift focus a little bit to the Bank of England's policy around dividends for the UK banks. We know that the Bank of England yeah. uh, slapped restrictions on the UK banking sector with regards to paying out dividends about nine months ago to conserve capital to cover losses from COVID-19. Then in early December, we saw the Bank of England ease restrictions on some banks, be enabling them to pay out dividends. But now we're in a situation where the virus has uh, become um, more easily spread and we are facing tighter restrictions yet again. What does that mean for the outlook for dividends for the UK banking sector uh, as we look to 2021 yeah. and, and perhaps even 2022? Well, where we rest is the statement in early December, which I thought was a very good statement in that it put the responsibility for making dividend payments back where it belongs, which is the boards of the banks concerned. It described some guide rails, if you like, about the kinds of amounts um, of dividend that the Bank of England would be prepared to envisage, but it left the responsibility for proposing that with the boards, and I think that's quite right. So what's going to have to happen in the next month or so is that each board of the big banks will have to look at the prospect, will have to rework in the light of what has changed in the economy and the changed lockdowns, et cetera, and decide what is really sensibly affordable in those circumstances. Um, and that discussion will now have to, have to, to go on. Um, but the basic framework, I think, was set out by the Bank of England in December. And as I say, I think is a decent compromise between where they were from last March, which was a sort of dividend ban, which I don't think is something that's tenable for the long run, and some, some heavy sort of uh, traditional governor's eyebrows um, saying, you know, of course you can pay a dividend, but be very careful about what you pay. And that seems to me to be a reasonable place to be at the moment.